So it's been a while since I've actually sat down and answered some questions for you guys. Everything regarding photography, life, creativity. I love actually answering questions in videos because I feel like they're usually a great way for me to get points across to you guys and also a chance for you guys to ask some questions to me as a photographer. So quite a while now, quite a while ago now, actually, I asked over on Instagram and on YouTube if you guys had any questions regarding life, photography, you know, really anything that might be interesting to you. And we got some great questions for here for this video. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first question is all about finding, you know, sources of inspiration in photography and who are my actual inspirations. And I think the best way to answer this question is first and foremost, I don't think necessarily looking at other photographers work all the time is the best way to get inspired. I think it's a great way to emulate other people's work, but I don't think it's a great way to necessarily always get inspired. Uh, with that being said, I do definitely have some photographers whose work I've been loving lately, and I would love to share some of that with you guys. The first is uh, the first is an obvious one. Christopher Anderson has been a favorite of mine for quite some time. I bought all of his books uh, regarding his family. He has shot each of his individual family members and made books about all of them, both his wife and his two kids. And these books are really impactful. You know, this list is ever evolving and rotating, which I think is great. You don't want to necessarily have the same favorite photographers your entire life. It's great to consume new work and consume new photographers, especially. I think it's great to not get attached necessarily to the same people over and over. You know, as an avid photo book collector myself, I think it's a great, you know, as an avid photo book collector myself, I think it's great to try to consume as much photographic work as you can off of a screen. Obviously in the digital age we live in now, it's pretty inevitable to go through someone's website or Instagram page. I think if you have the choice though, photo books to me are kind of the way that the artist intended for you to see their work. And I try my best to look through these as much as I can. Pretty much any time an artist that I follow or newsletter I subscribe to release any sort of printed book or zine, I try to pick it up not only for my own enjoyment, but I think it's also really important to support artists in this way. With that being said, I've accumulated quite a bit of photo books over the years, and my favorite way actually to buy books is usually when I'm traveling. On a recent trip I took to Copenhagen with my girlfriend and a few of our friends, we actually went to this museum and I randomly found this book that I really wanted to buy. The title of the book is called Keepers of the Ocean. And I'm definitely gonna butcher the photographer's name, but I believe their name is Inutex Storch. And this portrayal of kind of everyday life in Greenland, uh, I'm assuming it's kind of their inner circle of friends and family and the landscape of Greenland. I think to foreigners, you know, Greenland is a very kind of mysterious place that you only see about in movies and National Geographic documentaries. Uh, definitely a place that I would love to go visit. So I was pretty interested to pick this book up and, you know, see the portrayal of kind of their everyday life. I love the use of flash photography throughout the book. It has a very like point and shoot sort of fly on the wall feel to a lot of the images. And it's one of my recent favorite pickups. Christopher Anderson has also always been one of my favorites. I've talked about him a decent amount on the channel here. But his books on his family specifically are some of my favorites that I have in my photo book collection and two other ones for each of his children. And I love the portrayal of his family throughout these books. Looking at these images, it makes me really inspired to take my own photos of my family and loved ones and friends just to be able to look back on, but also, you know, be able to take these kinds of photos in an intimate way as he does. I love his use of light and color. And he's also very unique, I think, when it comes to composition. I love the tight frames that he captures. And also the way that he pairs a lot of his images is really beautiful throughout the books. Another photographer whose work I've really been enjoying is a German photographer. His name is Robert Riker, I believe is how you say it. He's a landscape and travel photographer. I also really enjoy his portraits. He has really beautiful work. I love all the work he's done for Amangiri, which is a kind of global hotel brand. I also really enjoy some of the portraits that he has shared recently. To me, what gravitates me towards his work is his use of color and light. Uh, it's very similar to the way that I like to do things, but I love the way that he puts a spin on it with his color grading and editing. The next question is, what advice would you give your younger self to start out your photography career? So in about a month in November, I'll have been doing this professionally for 10 years. I started when I was 18 and I'll be 28 in just about a month and a half. I picked up a camera almost 13 years ago now and 10 of those years have been spent trying to figure out some sort of photography career. Luckily, it's been able to actually come to fruition and it's starting to work really well. But when I start to think about how much I've learned throughout those years, it's really kind of astronomical. The amount of things that I've been able to learn I've tried to be a fly on the wall and a sponge as much as I possibly can, especially when I'm hanging out with other photographers or assistants or light techs that know more than I do. I would say one of the most important things that I've learned is to find your own voice within your art and within your career. You know, the world doesn't need more copycats. The world doesn't need more people emulating what's already out there in the world. 
it sounds like pretty basic advice, but really, if you actually think about what you're interested in and what you enjoy shooting, that's what the world needs more of. You know, they don't need another copycat of some landscape photographer or some lifestyle photographer. They need what you're interested in and how your unique eye sees all of that. And it took me a long time to figure out what that exactly was for me. And to be honest, I think I'm still kind of figuring that out. But the most important part in all that, you know, really is to kind of look inwardly and see kind of what piques your interest genre wise, you know, what kind of things are you gravitating towards and let that be kind of your guide throughout your career and also in the kinds of things that you shoot. When it comes to actually getting work and retaining clients, I think the best advice that I could give is you have to look at this a little bit more like a business and not an art pursuit necessarily. Those are two very different things. I think, you know, you can have both be simultaneous, but if you want to make this an actual career and make money from it, I think you have to treat it as such. And for me, that's been learning how to diversify and have different revenue streams. This YouTube channel is a great example of a different revenue stream that I have. And I've been building stuff like that for quite some time alongside my photography career. I think in today's age, you can't really just do one thing anymore. You have to be able to do several different things to be able to get by, especially when months are slow. So that's like some of my best advice, I think, for making a career out of this as well, is diversify and find other things that you can be doing to complement your main goal of your career. The next question is, how do I decide between the GFX or the X-T5 for a specific shoot? And to me, it comes down to a few things. The first thing being image quality. I think that's probably the most important out of all of it. What kind of image quality do I need? Do I want the medium format depth? Do I want like the massive file size that comes with that? Or am I cool with shooting a smaller camera and, you know, and utilizing that crop sensor as much as I can? To me, I kind of look at the X-T5 as a supplemental camera to the GFX system. I think if you own both, it's great. But if you just own the X-T5, that's also totally fine as well. In my experience, the X-T5 just isn't as robust as I would like it to be to bring it on professional shoots consistently. The GFX, and especially the brand new GFX 100 Mark II, which I'll be reviewing here on the channel pretty shortly, has all the different kinds of features and components that you'd be looking for in a professional camera. Also something like a Nikon or a Canon, or even a Sony really, for that matter, uh, make really robust full frame cameras that are perfect for any sort of work environment. I think it comes down to asking yourself, like, what do I actually take photos of on a weekly basis you know am i going to be shooting in a studio with a very high burst rate am i going to be shooting you know kind of slower interior and landscape photos uh, which the gfx definitely caters more to i think it's important to ask yourself those questions and that will kind of drive the correct camera for you to be able to bring on those shoots at the end of the day though for me it definitely comes down mainly to image quality and the robustness of the actual camera itself the xt5 takes amazing photos and i've had no problem bringing that along on several different client shoots but it's definitely not the camera I gravitate towards if that answers the question. The next question is, how do you pitch a project to a client of your choosing? And this is also a pretty complicated question. I should take an entire video, honestly, to break down this process and answer that for you guys. In general, I don't think it's as successful as maybe people think it is to just randomly pitch someone on an idea. A lot of brands don't have money just sitting around waiting for people to cold email them for projects. Some of them do, but most of them, I would say, their dollars are already spent on other marketing assets and photo shoots and video projects. So I will say if you're reaching out to someone, the most important thing is to have a plan. And what I mean by a plan is actually a well thought out, you know, project or response or, you know, just anything besides, hey, I'd love to work with you. I think a lot of people read that and are like, okay, well, this is about the minimal amount of effort that you could put into reaching out to me. Uh, I think showing some effort is, is a great way to get started. You know, if you want to be able to work with a certain client, Put the effort in into an idea and really flesh that out, whether that's a treatment or some sort of presentation. I think fleshing out an idea in general is just a great way to kind of get on the same page and make it easily digestible. Don't make it super long. Uh, you don't need to send like a seven paragraph email. Keep it short, keep it sweet. At the very least, you'll be connected for future projects. And at the best, you might be able to actually work on something together. Essentially what I'm saying is expressing any sort of interest is not enough anymore. You know, you need to have a plan. You need to have an idea of what you want to actually accomplish and be able to actually articulate that to the client that you're looking to work with. The next question asks, what is your archival process? I'm going to be making a video on this process actually here pretty soon, uh, but I am very meticulous with how I organize all my files after a photo shoot and how I keep things, you know, simple and clean. Essentially what I do though is I have a main kind of raid that I work off of and I also have multiple different SSDs for active projects. And the raid is a great ar archival system, but I try not to actually work on that constantly. Like I try to work off of the SSDs so I can travel with those and I can offload any sort of projects that I need to work on while I'm gone onto those SSDs. 
I create separate project files for all the different shoots that I have and I organize all those in a certain way. Again, which I am excited to actually explain all this to you guys in detail. Long story short, I am very organized with my archival process and I wanna make sure that it's easy to find an image even if it was taken you know, 10 years ago. I think that's you know the most important part for me. If I wanna be able to license an image or someone needs a copy of something, it's my job to be organized and make sure that everything is sort of easy to find. And the final question is someone asked, are you still happy in LA? And the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. I've been here for seven years and it's definitely home to me. You know, I think as far as like what it can provide for me at this point in my career, I don't see myself leaving anytime soon. It really is one of the best places to be, I think, if you're creative. I love the energy here. I love the other artists here. I've been able to make some really great friends over the years. And LA just feels like home to me. I don't think I'll necessarily always be here, but I think for now it's a great fit for me and what I'm looking to do with my life. I also love the accessibility of California, as you guys probably know. Being able to get out and head up the coast a couple hours it's pretty hard to beat. It's an amazing place to live and I'm very thankful to be here. Now with all that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys have any questions regarding any of the things I said, happy to answer anything. Uh, thank you all for asking those questions. It was actually really enjoyable to kind of sit down and chat with you about some of those answers. Before this video wraps up though, I did want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace for sponsoring today's episode. Now you guys know by now, Squarespace is a longtime supporter of this YouTube channel and I can't thank them enough for their continued support. Simply put, Squarespace is just the easiest way to make any sort of creative website, whether you're looking to display your work or create gallery pages, potentially even open an e-commerce store and sell digital or physical products. Squarespace makes it extremely easy to do all of this without really knowing anything about coding or any of the hassles that typically come with that. I've been using Squarespace since the start of my career and I can't recommend them enough to anyone who's looking to create any sort of website. If you guys want to check out Squarespace for yourself, there'll be a link down in the description to receive 10% off your first website or domain purchase. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and thanks to you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next one.